Hello, I'm Steph from iDriver Classic and today I'm back with this Humber 1225 from 1925 which I think makes it the oldest car that we've had on the channel or certainly one of the top two or three oldest that we've had. Now this car is incredibly interesting for many different reasons. Number one, it shouldn't be here. It was never intended to make it this far. It was a parts car and it's been revived in its full glory. And even though she now lives at the Lakeland Motor Museum up in the Lake District, who've kindly lent me the vehicle today, the car's restorer, Ken, has come all the way down today to speak with us and to not only do that, but to teach us how to drive the vehicle as well. So I'm going to take you on my, instead of the normal driving experience, I'm going to take you on my driving lesson on how we drive the vehicle. Because as you'll see when we get in, it's a very driving, different driving experience indeed. But first of all, I'm going to kick off with a walk around the outside of the vehicle and tell you a little bit about the history of this particular vehicle and Humber as a manufacturer. We've looked at Humber Super Snipe before, but by, by and large, Humber isn't a name we've covered a lot on iDriver Classic, and it's definitely something we need to remedy, because this isn't a brand which was not only known then for quality, but also now, but was one of Britain's largest car manufacturers, and claimed with their 1896 range to be the first company to produce a series of production cars. But cars weren't always where Humber set their sights, and like many other car manufacturers of the time, they originally manufactured bicycles. Although the manufacturer was a big West Midlands employer in the early part of the last century, and that's how many people remember them, the firm initially began in Beeston in Nottinghamshire, and it was this rapid growth which led them to set up the Coventry premises. And by 1907, 3,000 people were working at the Coventry factory, which is incredible. Now, the first car that Humber produced wasn't actually that far away from that big boom point. So they produced their first car in 1898, and by 1913, they were Britain's second largest car manufacturer, coming only second to Walsley. And through these early kind of couple of decades, the profit leap to make are enormous as well. So just for a bit of clarity, in 1905, they're making 16 and a half grand's worth of profit. By 1907, it shoots up to over £154,000. Now, the early part of that last century is very tumultuous because, of course, you've got the First World War, the Second World War. So by 1925, Humber's got a bit of a mixed bag. So the war years, they're doing really well, government orders coming in thick and fast to things like motorbikes. But by the early 1920s, the world of car manufacturing has produced more challenges. Because names that you'll recognise like Rover, Singer, Riley had stepped away from bikes and they thought, yeah, we're going to get a piece of that motor car automotive pie, both here and abroad. So Humber were facing a lot more challenges. Now, the 1920s is also the last decade before Roots came in and they did some interesting stuff. So in 1925, they acquired Comma to take a market share in that commercial space. But the real changes came into force for the brand at the end of the decade. And in 1931, I think it was 60% market share that Roots and Prudential took in the company. And after that, Humber was never independent again, which means that this 1225 that we're testing today is that last true era of Humber as a standalone independent manufacturer. Fault and all. Now, in 1923, going back to the 20s, Humber produced the new inlet over exhaust engine. It came in at 11.4 horsepower, and that's what it was classed as, as the model. Now, 1925, they step their game up a bit, and they make some improvements to the engine. It now has a capacity of 1795cc, which gives it a tax break horsepower rating of 12. Now, this is, this is put together by measuring the number of cylinders and the engine stroke only, but it actually has an engine output of 25 brake horsepower. So that might make the name of the car a little bit more obvious, giving it that 1225. If you're wondering about the transmission on this, these are the early days. You don't get lots of options. This is a four-speed transmission and this is the only option offered on the car. It's based around a ladder frame chassis and has leaf sprung suspension and rear drum brakes. And there's no brakes on the front. Oops, it's going to be scary. Allegedly, you can crack out 50 miles per hour in this car, but we're going to be safe and sensible today and we're not going to go above 35 miles per hour. Now, if you're wondering where it sits luxury-wise in the market, this is classed as a high-quality build car. 
for someone with money who understood quality and taste in good measure. And if you're wondering how it's priced in comparison, I'll pick, give you a car that you can picture easily in your mind. So in 1926, it was £440 for the Tourer, which is almost double what Ford were asking for the Model T. In total, there's five styles of coachwork available on these cars, with the four-seat four Tourer accounting for over 50% of total cars sold. Other options include the two three-seater, four-seater, the coupe, and with less than 5,000 of these cars ever made, it really does make it a true marvel to have it here with us today. Now, before we take it for a drive out, let's have a chat with Ken, who restored this vehicle from just being a spares car. Right, uh, I'm Ken Atkinson, and uh, I've got another Humber, very similar to this, that I ran for many years. Uh, and I really, I bought this for spares, uh, but there was only a chassis. Uh, the body had disappeared mysteriously. Uh, several years earlier apparently and it, it came from Scotland and eventually I discovered the body in London Enfield Middlesex and uh, so I re reunited the body with the chassis so it is and it's all original uh, numbers and everything like that so um, and instead of using it for spares I built it up as a a going car because my other car is a saloon and this one uh, I thought I'd have an open tourer as well which I did for a few years and eventually uh, I sold it to the museum oh well to, to Bill Bewley really um, uh, it was quite a long restoration but I'd already done this very similar thing on the saloon all the engine and such like so um, yeah I've, it's got a bit of a habit restoring cars now. Coming inside this Humber has been, for me, one of the most exciting automotive experiences I've had in quite some time. Because as you'll see when we go out for a drive, I've had to learn to drive in a completely different way. And whilst the dash is very spartan compared to some cars, for the time it feels quite advanced. Because bear in mind, if you're watching this video when it comes out, 2022, the car's nearly a hundred years old, which means that I was expecting a lot less. Now, if you come in front of us here, most of it is as it would have been, but there are a few little different bits and pieces. So I'll explain those as we go through. So over on your far left there, you've got your clock. In the middle, you've got an oil pressure gauge. Originally, that would have been a fuel gauge. And over to the right there, you have got your speedo. And it's also got a trip clock, which when you think about the fact that cars were coming out in the 1970s without it as standard, it seems very good indeed to be having that in the 1920s. I do feel like somehow we seem to go to a point and then we spare, paired everything back. This is a really nice golden age of motoring where cars were a real luxury in every sense of the word and you do tend to find that when you get into vehicles of this age. We talked about it when we were in the standard. But anyway, coming back inside here, this is our choke. As you can see, just pull that out there. We've got a map light in the middle, and over to the right here, we've got our Lucas control panel. So in the center there, you'll notice that you've got your amp meter, so that'll tell you if the battery is charging or not. And then you'll see this, I think it's Baker light, switch to the left. So you'll see it's turned to the far side of off. We turn it from off, so that's dynamo not charging, to dynamo on, and that's what you have to do to start the vehicle. So we'll come back to that when we start the vehicle up. On your right hand side there, you've got your light switch, so you've got headlights and you've got side lights. And then you'll see this. Now, to the untrained eye at a distance, it might look like something you're going to plug a USB cable in, but as you can see, it kind of runs flush. Now what that is, is it's an oil pressure light and it's essentially an oil pressure sensor. So when this car comes up to temperature and the oil's right and everything's okay, this will change from black through to white. Over on your right here, this is your push start for when we turn, so we don't, obviously we don't have a key, that's probably something I should have said. We don't have the key, we just have that switch and we just have this button. Now coming down from there, this for me is where it starts to get a little bit more interesting and it's stuff that we've not shown on the channel before. 
So first of all, let's talk about the steering wheel because we've got the horn there. So what on earth is going on here? Now, if you're a little bit uninitiated in the world of free wall cars like myself, you may never have seen this before, and I certainly hadn't. But this up here, this is your advanced and retard. So when this car would have been new, so at the moment it's not advanced because basically when it's warmer, when it's colder, you bring it back round and you retard it. But when it is warmer, and say you've had the car out like we already have today, because we've already filmed our drive segment, you have the advance further up here. Now, originally when the car was new, you should have been able to drag it down and onto here as sort of like a kill switch. So if you were driving and you wanted to bring the car to complete stop and turn it off, this is what you would have done. And below here, this is terrifying. This is a hand throttle. So if you watch there, and I'm going to have to film this separately, so I should be showing you this over the top now, um, you can see that accelerator moving. Now again, if you're initiated, uninitiated in the world of pre-war cars, you're probably saying, Steph, that's not the accelerator, but here's the thing. It didn't always used to go accelerator, brake and clutch. Before that, manufacturers could well, just did really whatever they wanted. So it wasn't quite, it wasn't at this point that everything was regulated. So on this car, you'll see it goes clutch, accelerator, brake. But here's the thing, we aren't gonna use that like a normal brake because the way you should drive this, there's no brakes to the front. I know I mentioned that on the walk around, but just a reminder, we do everything with this handbrake, which my right hand here is going down to here. So that's where the handbrake is. So it's almost like driving a continental vehicle in that all our action is going to be with our right hand because over here is our four speed gearbox as well. So as you can see, there's no covering on it and you can just change the gear and you can see which gear you're in. And then to get it into reverse, you just press that, I think it's brass button in the middle and that takes you over into reverse. So really that's everything. We have got a toolkit as well in that Gunson bag down there. But this is pretty much how the vehicle would have looked way back when she rolled out of the showroom. There's one thing I haven't shown you. So I'm gonna flip round before we start the car to show you what is called an Oster screen. Now this is an Oster screen. They're made in Birmingham. So if you come on in, I'll come and show you a bit better. Now as you can see, and we talked a little bit about how somebody probably would have been chauffeured in this vehicle. Well, you want it to be fancy. And these screens at the front are going to end up blowing the people about in the back and messing up ladies' hair. I mean, look at my hair, and I mean, I've been driving. But these, as you can see here, so you've got the screen here with these fold, fold down pieces. And then you have got this canvas fabric. Now, if you see here, you can actually move it and you can move it on both sides and you can pull it forward. So if you come back here, you can see that the person in the back is totally isolated and that they actually end up not being battered by all the elements. Now I thought that was just an interesting piece to include and I knew that some of you eagle-eyed viewers would spot it at home and wonder what it was. So with that covered off, we're gonna hop back in the driver's seat and we're gonna start the vehicle up. Well, now that I've shown you that Oster screen and I've waxed lyrical about how much I like this because I really do. I love vehicles of this era. I think they're so special and there's so few of them left that coming out and taking one out and learning how to drive in a different way is just an incredible experience. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna flip this round as we discussed earlier into dynamo. I'm gonna get my foot ready. So the first thing that you should do is I've been yeah, we need to check it's in neutral because it won't start if it's in gear. And what we're going to do is we're going to press this button to get her to start. So hopefully it will work. It's worked every other time, but this will be the time, won't it? Go on. Now that's what she sounds like from the inside, but I'm gonna flip the camera back round and you can hear from the back too. I thought 
to myself, who better to teach me how to drive this vehicle than the man who brought it back to life? So Ken gives a wave. Ken is the willing brave victim who is going to teach me how to drive this. And driving this vehicle is not for the faint hearted. So Ken, what do I need to know? Uh, well, we could turn it on, for, that's off. Yeah. That's on. Yeah. Uh, we won't need lights. Out of gear. Yeah, we're out of gear. Starter. Yeah, shall I press it? Yeah. Oh, hang on. Uh, that's... Oh. Well, we're advanced a bit there. That's what, okay. what happens when you're advanced. Yeah, go on. So whilst we're here, can you explain to us how this yeah. advanced and retard should be used as that, we drive? That's to start, really. Okay. And, and that's retarded so that it doesn't kick back. Okay. And that's a hand throttle, which you don't really need at the moment. Brilliant, okay. So you should start now. Okay. That's it. And now you can advance it yeah. fully up to here. Yeah, and a little bit more hand throttle. Yeah, well, it shouldn't really need it. But... Yeah, in fact, quick. Yeah, and we are. So I guess it's time for me to select a gear. Yeah, remember. That's it. Yeah. And we're starting off in first. Yeah, handbrake's off. Yeah. Remember where it is. I will. <laughs> now I know one of the things that you want me to, the two of the things you want me to remember on this is it's not the standard accelerator brake clutch on this. Sure. It is clutch, accelerator, brake, and this handbrake to my right hand side, my hand should always be on it unless it is changing gear. Yeah, that's it. Perfect. Now this is all very good in practice, but I might need you to help me do a bit of indication because I yeah. feel like I've got one hand on the wheel, one hand down here, yeah. and I'm gonna have no hands to indicate. So. Yeah. Might need I've your got help. a really long right arm. <laughs> <Can't do that. laughs> well, let's hope people are like, using their peepers today yeah. and that's just what we're doing. Yeah. Now, I've been warned this clutch has got quite a high biting yeah, You're point. on the wrong pedal. I am. There we go. Well, at least I wasn't trying to accelerate. No, that's good. Cool. It doesn't need much like, uh, throttle. What do you think? Second? Yeah, gently. That's good. There we go. It. I'll get it advanced and away you go. It's a bit bumpy down here. Oh no, it's good fun. Yeah. Do you know this is a lot easier to drive than I thought it would be? It's, it's quite light once it gets going. Yeah. yeah, and that is something that I would say to people at home because I think people are probably going to say, what's it like to drive, is no. it heavy? But it's very it's very light and it's very responsive. It, is, yeah. it doesn't feel almost 100 years old, does it? No, I, well, I'm just so used to it, I can't explain to people. No. <laughs> so what we'll do is we'll cut back into this video once we've got onto this um, dual carriageway. Just because what we're doing is we're waiting for a nice big gap. I think that is something, isn't it, that yeah. we should probably talk about, is that patience. You've got to be very been... aware of everybody else. Yeah. In this. And for anyone who's used to using a normal classic car at home, I would say my stopping distance has probably tripled at this stage. And um, we're going to go, I think. Yeah, let's go. Oh. Oh, goodness. Oh, That's sorry. It. Straight into third again now. Okay. So we're going up into third. And a quick flick into top. Yeah. Oh, you're thank you very much. Cruise mode now. So, what speed are we going now, then? Do you reckon? Uh, twenty-five. Twenty-five. Mm, and yeah. what's the top speed you've had out of a? Uh, about fifty, really. Not bad. Not bad. But forty is very nice. Thirty to forty, or whatever you feel happier doing. I think just because before I... your heart blows up. <laughs> I think because I don't know these roads, yeah. I'm quite keen to keep the speed that, lower. That's, that's good anyway, we're not going to upset anybody. No. I think. And for anybody watching at home who wonders, is it absolutely as cold as it looks? It is indeed. <laughs> but we're doing well, aren't we? And I think that a lot of people don't come into vehicles like this because they worry that they're going to be difficult to drive. Yeah. But I don't think this is a particularly taxing vehicle. Once you've got your head around those pedals yeah. and you've learned how to use your hands a little bit differently. I think they were designed to be used just in top gear really. Yeah. And people, you know, spared people changing gear. Can you manage all of it? But these are so interesting because they're from an era where 
people didn't have to have driving licenses. You had people that were had never been in a vehicle before, just jumping straight into something like this and going for it. it. Must have been such an exciting world to be in. Well, imagine going from something like a horse and cart to this. It must have been incredible. I think that I'm the thing that I'm trying to really do is be hyper aware of where my feet are. I think that's the that's the area that you'll come across. I'll remind you, don't worry. <laughs> Thank you. I don't think I've quite mastered it today, but I think oh, if yeah. I had it on long-term loan, or you know, had it for a yeah. week or so, I could probably get my head into the game of it. Well, you, you've got most of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's such a different driving experience. I think when we think about driving, I mean, 40 years ago. It's not that far removed from driving today, is it? But when you think about the difference between something like this from yeah. mid twenties to my car, which is mid sixties, the jump is absolutely enormous. You can't even see hardly now. Can no. You? <laughs> I think you'd need to be an octopus to drive this uh, effectively. Good. Got side lights on as well. Perfect. Thank you. You've done well with the gears. Oh, thanks very much. I think it's a lot of new stuff to learn on one test. Oh, it's it is, the yeah. pedals, it's all of this, yeah. everything. But thank you for being so patient and showing me how to drive. And I think for anybody watching at home who's maybe wondering what's made it such a different experience from driving a car from, say, the 40s or 50s, it's that pedal changeover, so we've not got the regulated accelerator brake clutch. Yeah. That's a strange thing to get your head around. And to also be using this handbrake quite so much. Yeah. Because if you think about it, you wouldn't use it that much, would you, in your normal modern car? Well, normally I do use a handbrake anyway, more than anything, because the foot brake works on the prop shaft. Yeah. So you're wearing your, your back axle and your dip out. So. So no, it's been a thoroughly um, interesting and pleasurable, despite the weather, afternoon with you. So thank you for um, thank you for spending the time with me and taking uh, taking some time out of your diary to show me what you're doing, what we're doing with this. Well, I've been driving you there now for nearly 50 years. So amazing. I'm quite happy. It has been an absolute privilege taking this Humber out today and not only getting to experience the car, being given a very good driving lesson, but getting to get a driving lesson from the man who built the vehicle and talked to him about the restoration has been totally invaluable. And it has been a huge, huge privilege. I cannot understate it. So a massive thank you to Chris from the Lakeland Motor Museum team who organized this for me, Lakeland Motor Museum for lending the vehicle. And of course, Ken, who shared all his wisdom and experience today and was awfully calm when I put my foot on the accelerator instead of the brake. If you haven't already been to the Lakeland Museum, Motor Museum, you definitely should. It's a really good day out. I did a video on it just recently, so you can watch that as well. And if you've rather enjoyed this test drive, there's some other pre-war vehicles on the channel, or if you've watched all the videos so far, we have borrowed a car from Chris and we're taking that out next week. And it's a manufacturer that we've never featured. So until next Sunday, when we meet once again, take care and drive safely.